everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Creating Synergy podcast. Today, we have an absolute powerhouse in the studio, Christine Zietz. From humble beginnings and being the only person in a university degree to be overlooked for a role, to going on to leading world-renowned defense companies and managing billion-dollar portfolios, Christine has been a force to be reckoned with in the defense sector. Her career started with Global Defense Prime, BAE, where she spent the first 25 years of her career, moving up the ranks and to eventually landing senior leadership roles and executive roles at Lockheed Martin and Leados, to where she finds herself today as the CEO of Northrop Grumman Australia. For those who might not know much about Northrop Grumman, you may have seen on the Hollywood smash hit Top Gun, they used their fighter jets in that movie. Christine, she's not just a business leader, she's also a trailblazer. She is the first female CEO in the top 40 largest defense companies in Australia. And she was recognized as the advertiser's 2023 top 40 power brokers, where she was also nominated as their woman of the year. Furthermore, her influence isn't just confined to the defense sector. Although she's the chair of the South Australian Defence Trailblazer Program, she's also a board member, an AFL Women's Committee member at the Port Adelaide Football Club and a board member at CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development Australia. From her early life to her illustrious career, today we'll deep dive into Christine's journey. From a self-proclaimed weirdo hippie phase where she's trying to make it into a corporate world to the lessons that she's picked up from every setback and triumph, all the way to her vision for the defence industry and she also shares her insights on the future and challenges and threats that face Australia in the coming years. So without further ado, let's dive into our conversation with Christine Z. So welcome to the Creating Synergy podcast. Today, we have the amazing Christine Zietz on the show. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to... I'm going to do something. I'll start a little bit different. I'm going to rattle off some statistics or even some of your career highlights probably is a better way of explaining. I, you know, doing some research on this before this podcast, I was looking through your career and going, holy hell, <laughs> <laughs> you put a lot of us to shame. So I'm going to just throw this out there. You're at BAE at 25 years where you ended up as the president of Northeast Asia, managing a portfolio of over 600 million. You're the vice president and managing director of Lockheed Martin with 700 staff and 300 million in revenue. Chief executive of Lidos, which spun out of Lockheed, uh, which is about 1,000 staff and 430 million in revenue. So you're currently the CEO of Northrop Grumman, which is about 800 staff. Uh, so Northrop Grumman in Australia, I should say. 800 staff and... About three thirty million. Three thirty million. Okay, I was look. I was trying to find that exact. Yeah, I don't number. think we published that really. <laughs> uh, first female CEO in one of the top largest forty defence companies in Australia. The advertiser two hundred twenty uh, two thousand and twenty three top forty power broker. A nominee for the advertiser two thousand and twenty three woman of the year. Um, in and amongst all this, you're the chair at the Defence Trailblazer. You're in the AFL football com- uh, Women's uh, Football Committee for Port Adelaide Football Club, deputy chair of the SBS Broadcasting Channel. You've been the board member at CEDA. You've been a board member at Port Adelaide Football Club, board member at Defence Industry Capabilities, <laughs> the board member of Department of Premier and Cabinet, trusted member of Adelaide Fringe and a council member of Flinders Uni. That is remarkable. You've done a lot. Well, I, I just seem old now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all in the last three years. <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, so kudos. Mm. I mean, that, that's an amazing career. Um, I can see a bit of a head wobble going on <laughs> over the other side of the table. So to understand Christine and who Christine is and, and, and your con- what, what, what do we need to know about your earliest context to understand the person that's sitting in front of us today? Well, uh, well... I'm an Adelaide girl and I guess I had a, an outlook from young of uh, wanting to be a businesswoman. I'm not yep. sure I knew what that meant when I was in my <laughs> teens. Uh, but I always wanted to do that and I felt like I could go forward and do it. So my parents were very supportive, although 
Uh, my father and mother, very traditional Greek mm. relationship. So mum didn't work. She worked with dad in dad's business. Yep. But she was really a supporter of my father. Yep. So what, that, was the, what was the business? So he had a temping bowling wholesale business. Oh, wow. Yes, and that was a labour of love. So he was an Australian champion, Tempin Bowling. Oh, very good. Um, and then got a got a job in uh, Norwood Bowl. Yeah. When they used to have the uh, pins that knocked down and they had pinballs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Guys that, that stood them up again. Yeah. So that was where he started. Wow. And then was a mechanic on that and then rose to manager of Norwood Bowl. Then started importing products in his garage, then built a warehouse, then built his business. So really... Superb Amazing. achievement yeah. and quite old in yeah. his age. Yeah. You know, he started that probably when he was 40s. Yeah, great. So before that he was a champion ballroom dancer. Ah. And that's how we met my mum. Who was also a dancer. Well, she was doing her debutante okay. when she was 18 and he was her teacher. Ah, there you go. So there was um, it's a true romance story right there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So very good. So, so um, I think from a, a younger years, let's start there. I mean, who was Christine growing up? Yeah, well, you know what came to mind then was odd, uh, because <laughs> I was uh, I always seemed to be in the minority. Um, at school, I went to the local Forbes Primary School, and probably the only Greek kid there, mm. maybe one or two you're, others. You're born here. In I was born here, and my parents were born, born here, but they, all. Yeah. 100% Greek. All my grandparents yeah. are Greek. Yeah. So as you can see, I look very and Greek. The, and the culture is, <laughs> the Greek culture is very strong. I know this, I'm Italian and I think yes. we're very similar in, yeah. in the culture aspect. But Greeks always have uh, probably that little bit of an edge on us when it comes to their culture. <laughs> well, I, I love the movie My Big Greek Fat yeah, Wedding. Yeah. I just love it. It's, it's really close to my heart. Yeah. So there is a strong culture. It's a beautiful culture. It is. Uh, but it's different. Mm. And so I always felt a little bit different. Um, I used to be guarded by my girlfriend, who's still my closest friend, who when anyone asked me where I was from, she used to defiantly get in front of me and say, <laughs> she's from here. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of a first realisation of that almost singling out of a minority. Mm. Um and then as I moved on, being a woman in defence was a minority as well. Mm. So I've kind of always been a bit of a minority, which has some challenges but also has some benefits because you stand out. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things about moving forward in your career is you've got to be noticed. So Absolutely. that's the flip side. Yeah. So I, sticking with the, the childhood, what was one – of your most cherished memories uh, in your formative years that sort of – that you think maybe set you up for the person that you are today? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I think from my formative years it would be my friendships, I think. Mm. Um, I, I, I really loved friendships. My girlfriends were very special to me. Yeah. And that's probably a little bit different as well from the Greek culture of Greeks and Greeks. So yeah. these were non-Greek yeah, girlfriends. Go. And there was some dynamic there with my father. We weren't allowed to have sleepovers. And <laughs> and uh, and so when dad travelled a lot and when he was away, mum was much more lenient. <laughs> so there was a partnership there. So you look forward to dad going yeah. away. <laughs> I think that's probably the memory is yeah. this way that we used to navigate through my around my father, um, which I think did keep – really teach me some negotiation skills, yeah. awareness, EQ, you know, when to ask, yeah. when to not, you know, read read him. And so I think memories from when I was young was that, was that kind of navigation through the household and my father with my mother, with my friends. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So, again, I, and I'm, I love these old the, old, the old school stories of growing up. I think um, – for me, it's what, what was one memory that when you do look back, like a random memory that you do look back and it just makes you really smile? Oh, I was number one girl at Space Invaders. Oh, really? And my at boyfriend. The, at, the, at the arcade? or is Yes, that, across yeah. the road from the school there was a little <laughs> arcade and, and Neil was my grade seven boyfriend and he was number one out of the boys. So we were the hot couple. I could... Kill anyone. There's another space romance invaders. story. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that is the best game <laughs> ever. Bring back Space Invaders. So I'm quite competitive. Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's certainly pulled through from and, my childhood. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's held you in good stead. 
in in a previous conversation, I'm going to throw this out there, and you said the word odd before, so I'm going to kind of allude to this because I think is what you uh, what you you said um, growing up, and you're trying to uh, you know carve out a path in the corporate career. You yes. said that you were, and I'm going to um, inverted commas here, a weirdo hippie is the word that you use. Can you elaborate on what a weirdo hippie is? Look, uh, well. <laughs> could be called many things. Another <laughs> one would be a bit of a dag. <laughs> so I went to uni from uh, from a, um, I think, again, being that slightly odd person, you kind of play into that a bit more. Mm. And I was uh, the girl that had, you know, unusual earrings, different earrings in different ears. Yeah. I had long, very long, long hair. I used to wear happy pants. Oh, um, love the happy pants. Which uh, was actually one of my enduring factors – for my husband. He <laughs> loved my happy pants. Um, do you and still rock them? <laughs> I do, my I yoga do? pants. Yeah, there but, you go. But no, so, but I used to wear them publicly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So <laughs> I, I was uh, very relaxed and a bit more way out and a bit more gregarious than, than the uh, classmates I had. Mm. So I studied economics accounting. Yep. And um, that's not the most vibrant. It wasn't drama and art where probably I looked like I fitted in, mm. but it was economics, accounting and business. And so I was, again, stood out a little bit. Yeah. So let's, let's get into that. So you uh, you go through high school and you, you get into uni in economics, accounting. Um, I remember you saying after you graduated, you had some issues getting some jobs. Is I that did. correct? I did. And this is where I smile now with young, p- talented people that are worrying about getting a job, I just share with them that uh, you'll be fine. Yeah. And I was the one – different time then. Uh, I went to Flinders Uni and mm-hmm. that cohort was probably about 40 people. Mm-hmm. And in those days, the big four at the time, accounting firms, came on campus prior to exams and interviewed individuals, so KPMG, PwC, yep. et cetera, Ernst Young, and they put offers to people before – the exam. So there was such a d- demand for um, this is the accounting stream. Yeah. And so everyone had their interviews and I, this is my learning, was very relaxed and, <laughs> and I thought I had like this conversation, very relaxed yeah. and, and enjoyable kind of laughing conversation with the interviewers thinking I got on very well and, and was just, this was my first really hard fall. Um, everyone else in the course got an offer except me. Yeah, wow. And so that, 39 of them. Yes, the yes. And that was, you know, incredibly embarrassing mm. because my grades were as good as everyone mm. else. So then it's like, well, what, what, what is this? And it's me, mm. uh, clearly, um, st- sitting out, very different. So that was, and I do remember um, having some tears still. Uh, I can see myself, you know, on the bed thinking, am I ever going to get a job? Mm. You know, this is terrible. So it was really... It would have been hard. That was really hard. And, and do you think, looking back, it was like, you know, referring back to the weirdo hippie thing. Oh, Did you, definitely. It, it was just your, 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 the way you presented. Definitely. Too familiar, too relaxed, mm. um, dressed inappropriately. Yeah. They wanted... <laughs> they wanted Clean and crisp corporate, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. And look, I I, I, w- I tell this story sometimes um, because you know I do coach and mentor a lot of women, mm-hmm. and some women are struggling with the balance of you know I should be who I am. Yeah. And if the world doesn't like that, well, that's their problem. And I just try and I tell that story and just suggest that the world is as it is. Yeah. So there's a choice. You know, you kind of fit in. And then proceed and and get to a position where you can change some of the rules and some of the perceptions. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, I learned very quickly. I guess that it, it seems to be I do reflect and change. Mm. And so I did go to an accountancy placement group. Yeah. And uh, this is how I landed in defence because British Aerospace at the time, BA Systems was yeah. called British Aerospace, had a graduate role. And I went to that in a totally different persona. Yeah. I had a grey suit. My hair was back in a plait. Earrings were out. I was extremely uh, subdued and I got the job. Yeah. Mm. Do you look back and think, and even, you know, in regards to your comment of the people you mentor and coach, do you, do you look at that situation and, and think, well, that's a shame? It's a shame that society is that way? It is a shame, but I, I, but I think the... 
the, you know, the tagline I say is life's not fair. Mm. You know, so you can either kind of sit there and say, well, that shouldn't be. And you know, why was it, that? Yeah. You know, it's not fair. I am the same person. And I remember doing a speech once and afterwards um, a teacher had a table of girls. Uh, it was a women in leadership seated speech. Yep. And she actually um, approached me after. I told a bit of a story like that. So, so the lesson was you just have to do – you do have to consider how to fit in and, and, and move up through the organisations and then affect change. Mm. And she was – she did not like my message. Mm. And she said to me, I don't think this is a good message you're teaching these girls. But my position is, well, I can teach them to be themselves um, and, and you can be yourself but to be totally ignorant of the environment is not good coaching. Yeah. And so, you know, my coaching is you've got to understand the space you're going into mm. and you may have to adjust yourself if you want to achieve, you know, your yeah. goal. Yeah, well, I, I, I like your approach. I think because there's a part of me that wants to challenge you as well, right, that yep. says – um, well, you know, it, it, it seems unfair that someone would need to change because of the way society is. But then it's, to your point, the best way to enact change is to get through the ranks, become a leader of that industry or sector or whatever it might be and enact change that way. Because there's no point going in with a sledgehammer approach. It's just not going to work. Yeah, and look, this is a very personal subjective yeah. Topic, you know, different yeah. people will advise different ways, but but I've certainly found that I can be true to myself um, and modify yeah. a bit for the, you know, so okay, I wore a suit instead of happy pants. I wear happy pants at home. <laughs> uh, you know, I wear happy. You know, I, I I dress quite casually to the football. Yeah. Um. D so you know, that's my space, yeah. and so it just matters. But I have affected change being in the senior roles that you spoke about, CEO of yeah. those companies and, and made structural, systematic change to those organisations to allow women to progress. So um, it's an approach that I've taken and, you know, I, I think I think it will change over time. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, yeah. do you think it's yeah. do you think it's different? Like it's obviously different now than when it obviously, was when you, yes. were, you were you were going through the yeah. ranks. But... And is it in, I mean, every industry is different, right? So that entrepreneurial world, that uh, the arts and theatre world, it's kind of where, where, whatever yeah. you want. But this corporate world, it, it still does have a bit of that you've got to look and fit in. A little bit. But you know what I'd say is today with the talent, you know, that people are looking for, the recognition of young people, I doubt, I would think, if I was on the campus and being interviewed, I think they would probably <coughs> recruit me. And then have a bit of a discussion about, you know, perhaps in the workplace, yeah. you might like to yeah, just yeah, yeah. modify a little bit. Um, I think that's shifted. I think people can be a little bit more tolerant yeah. um, nowadays. I agree. This is 30, it's five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> so BA, uh, yeah, BAE or British Aerospace yeah. um, Opportunity presents itself. Was You know, you, you mentioned earlier that you wanted to get into the world of business. Was defence something that you had in mind or was it just sort of through uh, opportunity that you landed in that industry? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I was um, desperate for that job, yeah. you know, to really put myself back on the standing, I thought, with my peers, mm -hmm. you know, so I got a job. Yeah. And it really wouldn't have mattered, I don't think, for me what that was. Mm -hmm. uh, but going into the job and, and working in the industry, I now, you know, through my career, I just absolutely love defence and security. I'm very passionate about it. And I'm just very happy that I started there and fell into it. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you love about it now? Well, I love that it's so meaningful. Okay. You know, I, I, I talk to our people in our company about our mission and purpose, you know, it is so meaningful what we do because we provide our defence force with capability to defend the nation. Mm. And, you know, I, you know, yeah. some people feel uncomfortable with defence, but I would say that if everyone was of the like-mindedness of we as a nation and our allies are, i.e. democratic freedom of personal yep. speech, rights, you know, and, and other countries are not, you mm. know, these countries that are, um, you know, suppress people's rights and and uh, free speech, um, dictatorship, 
Yeah. Uh, and and we do not want to fall into that place. And yeah. So we have to we have to have a posture and a yeah. partnership that um, deters those uh, those advocacies from um, from coming over and taking over. Yeah. I I think. I do. I support you on that on that theory. I think it's ignorant to think that we can walk around with our heads in the sand and everything's fine. Like it just we just can't do that. So that there, hence the reason for for defence. Do you want your family to be safe? Is the, the question that you've got to ask yourself. Yeah. Well, this is what we're trying to. I think I struggle with not being in control of any of it. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, as a, as a civilian, it's yeah. kind of like. Uh, some of the decisions get made, I don't yes. really know. Some might not be as transparent as I'd like or some might not be uh, uh, with the of highest integrity as I like, but, you know, yeah. that's life. I think that's fair. And, mm. um, you know, I think being in the industry, I have close up, you know, security clearance. I understand those decisions that public, perhaps the public will look at and think, why on earth are we doing that? Mm. You know, so, so I have an intimacy and an understanding probably yeah. that benefits me in the support of that probably more. Yeah. But uh, there's no doubt the, um, the attacks, certainly the cyber attacks are at a phenomenal level, mm. you know, so these are, these are um, reaching into our, our corporates and our way of life, our infrastructure, mm. you know, to continually try to take hold and steal, you know, IP and, and all of those things. Yeah. For. So, you know, the work that, that uh, ASIO does and, and is just phenomenal. Yeah. So I Recently we did a, a podcast with um, Stephen Marshall, oh, the yes. former Premier. Port Adelaide supporter. He is a <laughs> huge Port Adelaide and, and true one-eyed supporter. Mm. Like it's... The ones I like. <laughs> <laughs> he... I asked him a question about when you got into office for the first time, what was the th one thing that surprised you the most? And he and, and he said, yeah, in the briefing, and he just basically said the amount of cyber – I did not realise the amount of cyber security attacks that were coming our way every single day. Yeah. It was it was mind-blowing. Um, we'll get into cyber security a bit later and some of the things that happen around in defence, but I, I do want to – continue on with your career and your yep. your uh, your advancement through your career to where we are today. So BAE, 25 years, what kept you there for so long? I know. it was. It, sometimes I tell young people I was somewhere <laughs> for 25 years and their expression is just disbelief. <laughs> Look, I was extremely fortunate. I don't think I stayed in one job longer than two years. Yeah, okay. So, you were so every uh, step I was asked to do another challenge, another you know, it wasn't, I didn't start thinking I'm going to be here for 25 years. But I started as a graduate accountant and very quickly I was moved into corporate accounting where I did audit and statutories and then I was quickly moved into being the accountant for one of our divisions. And in those days, BAE was, I'm talking, $80 million turnover. Yep. When I left them, they were $2 billion turnover. Yeah, so, so you, you know, it was you very saw, small. You saw a big growth. I saw a big growth. So one of my little division that I was the accountant for uh, next to the general manager was only $20 million turnover. Yeah, it was well, one big project. Yeah. And I was the accountant, the payroll clerk, the accounts payable clerk, you know, accounts receivable Do clerk. Really? I just did every. It was a great learning experience. Yeah. I did that for two years. And that was uh, when I started to get exposed to the leadership team. Yep who were all male mm -hmm. and some of the commentary around the table, you know, as I say, 30 years ago was, was eye-opening for me mm. as a young woman because there was commentary around um, particular discussion. I remember a manufacturing manager was a woman mm -hmm. and she had a child and came back and she was wanted to do an MBA but she was pregnant with her second child. And, the dis and I remember this very clearly. The discussion around the table was, well, gosh, I mean – she really needs to work out whether she wants to be a mother or a manager. Oh, yeah. And I was, you know, 23 or 4 thinking, oh, really? Okay, so that, I didn't realise I needed to trade off. Yeah, well, Is that how it works? And so it was, it was very fundamental conversation, I remember. And it was – then I started to notice the difference of approach with women coming through to men yeah. and the systematic barriers – you know, the bias and we, we did not have the term unconscious bias in those days. Yeah. So so I started to 
appreciate that there was a difference. And uh, when I came in and run, I ran the payroll in yeah. corporate. And so I was, you know, I could see salaries and then I could see that I was being paid much less than my counterparts. Yeah. So there was a question to that. And so it was really interesting how I started to observe and understand yeah. that there's actually When you a say difference. you appreciated the difference, mm. did you despise it as well? Yeah, I was not happy. Yeah. Um, and I remember talking to uh, the leader of HR at that point and just said, you know, wh where, is this how it is? And she said, I remember this too, she said, well, Christine, she said, you know, to progress, you've got to be twice as good as the men. <laughs> and she said, just as well you are. <laughs> so I thought, okay, there just you go. keep doing That's the job. That's why I'm progressing. But, that, but I'm progressing, I'm twice as good as them, but I'm but getting paid less than them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that... That's, that's so unfair. It's a difference. And it's, it's interesting also. The other observation that I had as I was working through uh, was I had a very, I don't know really where it came from, but if I'm given a task, I'll get that deadline in. Mm. Um, so being that accountant for the division, you had monthly reports that were due. You know, everything would, came in quite late. So I would work till two or three in the morning to get that report in. Um, and I was surprised to see that others would be late. Mm. And so I started to see a distinguishing factor between my standard and actually, quite surprisingly, maybe the majority. Mm. And so you, you had a, an edge, if you like, because you were doing your job, mm. which I found extraordinary. Yeah. So you're doing what? I still do. <laughs> it's like it doesn't make sense. We've been given a deadline, I've delivered to the deadline and yet everyone's surprised by it. <laughs> I know and I remember again a meeting where the CEO said, you know, we just have to have these reports in on time because he was getting frustrated and my general manager said, he said, no one's had their reports in on time. Actually, it was the finance director and he said, well, actually, Christine's had her reports in every day. And he said, well, she should be promoted. <laughs> and I thought, really? <laughs> Is that, Is that how it works? So I just think it's so interesting as you come into an organisation. I think it gets back to that that um, navigation I had with my father at home. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm continually watching, continually reading yeah. how decisions are made. You know, what matters, yeah. what doesn't matter, and and kind of move through that uh, and perform. It's funny mm. how simple it is. We. Um, as you know, we're a consulting firm and, and do a lot in the change and change management space and the culture space, workforce space. We received some feedback, like some great feedback the other day and the client came in and did a video testimonial and all the above. And and I said I asked the question, like, what you know, what separates Synergy IQ from from the rest? And he said, Well, you you do what you say you're gonna do. <laughs> 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 Like, he goes, it's, 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 it's that go. simple. You do what you say you're going to do. And, you, and you're good people. You're pretty passionate about it. So yep. it was, it, yeah, it just, it made me laugh because it's exactly right. It, it, there are so many people missing deadlines and missing yeah. Um, and, yeah, finding excuses as to why they can't do it. Um, so let's keep going. So you've, uh, you're starting to learn the system and you're starting to learn it's a little bit one-sided throughout your career. So how did that look as you were, you were moving up in your career? Yeah, so I, I was, you know, very, very privileged to have a couple of senior leaders that believed in me and had no kind of concern around female, male or anything like that. And, and they, they, they were phenomenal as I look back, you know, took a risk. Um, when I moved, I actually resigned because it was a small business and I'd got to, to doing the corporate accounting, the... the um, divisional accountants. I'd kind of done everything in five years. Mm. <laughs> and so I said to the finance director, you know, I think I need to go somewhere else and, and, and expand because I can't be the finance director because I'm, you know, too young. I understood that. And they said to me, well, is it the company or is it the role? And I said, no, no, it's my, it's my role. And they said, well, let's move you. And they moved me into what we call commercial, so pricing, so when we quote. Mm. And you price and then that's where my next probably 15 years was in the whole space of risk management, the price you quote with the risk, with the uh, procurement, the supply chain, matching all of those contracts off, uh, making sure we've got a good deal mm. while the engineering team and the project team 
drive the solution. Yeah. So I did the commercial part yeah, of it. Yeah, great. And uh, and I just went from kind of a small, you know, $8 million bid to the bigger, to the bigger, to the bigger, you know, and then you're in the kind of 300 million, yeah, 400 wow. million bids. Um, and so through that time we had, uh, you know, I just had great sponsorship from my boss in that area that sent me across to the Middle yeah. East, you know, 26. Yeah, wow. To uh, negotiate our military vehicle contract, mm. which was about $25 million. Was that the... Kuwait. That was Kuwait. Kuwait yeah. yeah. And that was just such an extraordinary experience, um, especially because the organisation we sold the vehicles to did not allow women on their premises. Yeah. So uh, it was – and it's, since then I have worked in, in the Middle East. I've worked in Japan. I led yeah. the office in Japan who also have, uh, you know, a, a, a view that women – you know, probably don't really belong in the workplace. Um, they're shifting in Japan, but they're still, you know, very hierarchical. And even even today. Very, even today, I would say that um, it's not common for a, a woman to progress through and men to work for women, a Japanese woman. And same, you know, in Arab, the, the Kuwaitis still now, of course, uh, would not have a woman that they report to. So is having... That, is that the same if, it, like, from, from their country that... Understanding their culture a little bit, you yes. can see it. But from a Western point of view, do they is it do they view Western w women it's the different. same? Yeah. No, they don't, and that's what I've learned. So you yeah. can do business in those places as a Western woman because they respect that you are from that company, and that company has given you the authority to come and meet with them. Yeah. So in Kuwait, Isn't that's that what it was, yeah. and uh, but I was a little bit an, like a novelty. Yeah. Um, because I was in the room, you know, there were no female bathrooms. Because oh, wow. females weren't allowed on the premises. So, you know, it was all a little bit different. Yeah, wow. And um, a little bit uncomfortable. But through that you grow. And, you know, that experience for me is still a standout kind of throw in the deep end. Mm. Um, Did they experience. treat you well? Yeah, they did. Like, yeah. A bit, bit of fun it was. Yeah. <laughs> so it was Mr. Mr. Uh, the gentleman I was with, Mr. Gomes, Mr. Daly, Mr. and Miss Christine. And they, they, I think they had quite a bit of – it was a no, novelty. Yeah, novelty. Wow. But we did the deal. We sold the vehicles mm. and, um, you know, and I learnt a lot and then came back. So it was just – it was always very interesting work. And mm. then I did some work in Indonesia. Um, I, uh, I moved across different areas of the business. Uh, I went off to England um, to work at head office for two years yeah, just great. after I had my first – daughter and that was again the sponsorship I actually had Jim McDowell on the podcast oh yeah I have had Jim yep superstar mm. Jim's a great guy and he was my boss for five years hey, great. and uh and really could not see a reason why I couldn't go to England even though I was trying to have a baby mm. which uh I still remember his his comment to me when I said look Jim you know I don't know that it's the right time for me to go to England and I told him very privately so I was about 30, you know, I'm, I'm trying for a baby. And he said, oh, he said, uh, last time I heard you can conceive in London. <laughs> and it was just this response that I thought, you know, it was, I was here kind of narrowing down yeah. to how could I possibly work with a new, newborn in yeah. another country. In my, in my and he just nailed it with, yeah. what's the problem? Yeah, it's, Just it's, work it out. Yeah. And so. Oh, I loved him. We did. Yeah. And uh, That's so great. I managed to go. I did fall pregnant, had Jesse 21 years ago and then uh, we went across to England with Jesse at six months. Oh, beautiful. And worked there. Just one child now? How many? Um, then I came back pregnant. Oh, very good. Uh, with Charlie, um, who's 18. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've always interested in the in the whole travelling the world part for defence and, you know, and using the QH story. And and for 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 back lack sorry lack of better terminology, creating weapons or or something for another country which potentially yeah you know, I mean who knows right I know they're yeah. allies but potentially could be used back against us how did that sit with you Well, it's all very very it's extremely well regulated okay so you have uh, governments have an end user agreement for defence articles. Mm -hmm. So you can't sell defence articles, um, products, technology to certain countries. Okay. And 
it's quite restricted. So it is also traced to, you know, perhaps an, a, a relation to that country is this country, so we're not going to allow you to sell it to that country. Yeah, okay. So, so it's kind of like a... Yeah, very much a so. A trail, yeah. Very much a trail. So when I was in Northeast <laughs> Asia, uh, it was mainly our US business that I was facilitating products into Asia and we did not do business in China because we're not allowed to. Okay. So we certainly did with South Korea, who's an ally, Japan, not North Korea. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very prescribed. Yeah, okay. Very interesting. Mm. Very interesting. So so now we're we're uh, in a in a role in, in BAE over in Tokyo. Is that where you ended up That's before where I you ended? Yeah. yeah. I think just before that when I came back pregnant with Charlie, that was another time that we broke the mold yeah. of the normal uh, systems and processes in a business that are that are biased just because they are. The majority of the population were were men and yep. so when I came back I had been on the leadership team of mm -hmm. BAE for 10 years and I came back and wanted to work part-time so I worked three days when I had my second child I worked three days for three years yep. and it was like oh my gosh what do we do with Christine <laughs> you know because the only part-time had been for administration people mm. and so now you've got a senior director ex-commercial director of the company wanting to work three days and this is where Jim came in again yeah and Jim just said, well, go and help Harry on, uh, and Fred on that large tender. So I went and worked. And uh, when we got to the point where I ran the commercial side of this was an $800 million tender, a bid, three days a week. And we just did it by restructuring the team. I had a, I had a deputy that was there five days. Yep. Um, I had an arrangement where I was physically there. This is before COVID and work from home and this yeah. is – this is 18 years ago. Yeah. And I had uh, an arrangement where I was paid three and a half days. I was there for three and that half just carried me through to do work when needed. Um, but it was just a great example of crashing the barrier and the yeah, mindset. Yeah. Fabulous. And, and this is when, again, you're in a position where you can do it mm. um, rather than coming in without the influence to do yeah. it and then trying to bash it down. So what so, would it have looked like if you weren't in a leadership role in those days? Um, coming back part time, yeah. I don't think they would have done it. No, you wouldn't have been able to work on that bid yeah. part time. And I have a lovely story of a gentleman who who smiles at me when I tell it, and I tell him I tell this story. Is he was the campaign manager, and he was scheduling the campaign reviews for Fridays, <laughs> and I didn't work on a Friday. Mm -hmm. And I remember the conversation very clearly where I said, you know, Martin, I can we please have the campaign meetings on a Wednesday and he said, well, you might be working part-time, Christine, but the bid is not part-time. And I thought, oh, okay, we've got a bit of a problem here. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, and you was fish it out. Was that a report out. of yours or was that a, a peer? It was a peer. Yeah, okay. And so we, we worked through that yeah. and now he's an absolute advocate of flexible, you know, you yeah. can make it work and yeah, yeah. it's just that mindset. But we well, changed. you know what you know, right? And at the you time that's absolutely. all they knew. Absolutely. And then the way in which you have that conversation is so important. Mm. Um, I've learnt uh, from my kind of bashing down things to understanding where they're coming from and what's your concern and how can we work this. Yeah. But the other thing that uh, we changed was when I became part-time, one of the rules were you had to come off the high um, potential list. Mm. So most companies have a talent yep. list and, and for talent they, they do things, yep. train you more give you a more access, give you a mentor, you yep. know, these things. And again, I remember Jim coming in and saying, Christine, you have to come off the talent list. I said, why? And he said, because you're part-time. I said, well, how did I lose my potential because I'm part-time? <laughs> and he goes, I know, it's stupid. And then we went and changed it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. At least he was uh, – it's good to hear that Jim was open to that and, and, and was a big part of, uh, of changing the mould. I'm interested in the way you said you had the conversations. Like I think when you are dealt with a situation and we see it time and time again and we used the word sledgehammer before but it, it, yeah. you, you, the initial reaction is just to bite back and go, well, hang on, that's unfair and this scream of uh, righteousness yeah. and, and justice and whatever it might be. But your approach now is, 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 it, is it to hold and stay calm and then – so can you explain how you would go about that? That is so different to – to me, that's a real skill I've had to work on and develop. Mm -hmm. And a little bit again with, 
with Jim had a big influence on me. He also used to tell me quite often, actually, I'm not always right. Uh, and so I was very confident, probably quite clever. Yeah. And so I would dissect information very quickly and come to a conclusion. But it was only the information that I had. Mm. And so Jim's point was really, you might think you're right, but other people have got views and there might be other information. You've got to bring that in. Mm. And so I kind of went from a, I'm right um, and quite determined in my view. And if people had different views, I was quite frustrated. Um, so they're, they're never as good. Are oh, they? you, you know, it's, it's just, <laughs> oh my gosh. And so this has been a continue in my 360 diagnosis. Yeah. <laughs> He's always been, Christine could listen a bit more, <laughs> take into consideration others' accounts. But the edginess on that has kind of come down on the years. Yeah. It still shows up yeah. even for the one I did probably two years ago. Yeah. So I continually work on it as we all have to work on, you know, these natural things. But no, I feel I'm better at my first gut reaction is, you know, if someone says something that I just think is short-sighted and a yeah. bit ignorant and, you know, I'll... I'll I'm better at just thinking, okay, well, let's just explore why they yeah. think that. Let's start with that. And then yeah. it's often from a personal experience, you know, you can't have that job part-time. Okay, let's explore why. And then you find out that they had a bad experience with another staff member a few years ago, you know. Or, mm. You know, and you say, well, what if we, you know, tried it for three months? You know, what, negotiate. Why do you think it's so hard to slow down? I mean, because like, yes. do you know, that's kind of what we're, doing isn't it It, it, because the answer is like that's bullshit let's get on with it and come on we need outcomes and results but the skill set is actually to slow down it is and why is it so difficult to slow down i know and you know i i see colleagues of mine that actually are quite natural Mm. at slow down I, i think they're more reflective mindsets yeah i am extremely quick you know to a decision yeah and, uh, and, and I've, you know, you learn everyone's different and members of my team now, some of them, uh, you know, I don't have the conversation, uh, you know, Daniel, uh, these are the three things. I think we should do X. What do you think? Mm. You know, with those people I say, Daniel, these are the three things. This is what I think. Think about it overnight and come back tomorrow and tell me what you think because I know they need to, to, uh, to yeah. process and consider and, yeah. <clears throat> and it's actually a strength. You know, I have a strength too and they're, and they're balanced and back to diversive, diversity yeah, of team yeah. and diversity of thought. You know, I think it's really compelling when you have both types, you know, of thinking in your team. Mm. Um, but I've learned to understand that not everyone is, you know, mine works like yours works. So I think you probably are a bit like me, so you find it hard. Yeah. Whereas some people don't. Don't. They're don't. just they're happy to. Yeah, I'm kind of like you. I think one of my key strengths is I can see – I can see where it's going to go on and where it's going to end up. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, and it just makes logical sense. Can we just make the decision now? But, <laughs> like, why we, what, like, why do we need to wait a week for it? It doesn't make sense. But, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm grappling with that. I reckon I'm, I'm um, you say you've learned that skill. I think I'm <laughs> learning that skill. So, <laughs> okay, so where are we now? Lockheed. Yes, so I left uh, BAE and I left because I wanted to be a CEO. Yeah. And this is some more coaching that I say to people is this. You really want and have uh, an ambition for something and you think you can do it. You know, it meant that I left an organisation after 25 years that I loved and and really um, invested a lot in me and, and, you know, I worked very hard for it and then uh, came to the conclusion that they – uh, at that point, they changed later, but they continued to want to put a Brit- British person in to lead yeah. the Australian business, which yeah. is absolutely, you know, their prerogative. But so I did not come back to Australia. I left from Tokyo mm-hmm. and I went um, for an interview for Lockheed Martin and I ended up being employed running a line of their business. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, about two weeks before I started, they called me and said, oh, just so you know, Christine, the line of business you're running, we're going to sell. So I did not really ever become a strong part of Lockheed yeah. Martin. We were kind of bookmarked and on the market yeah. and waiting to see who, who acquired us. Yeah. Um, but in that time, I pulled together a strategy. And uh, thankfully, Lidos, who acquired us, had a very aligned uh, business intent. Yeah. 
and they only had about 30 people in Melbourne and, and we were 800 people that yeah. moved from Lockheed to Lidos. So you can tell 30 so, people, so 800. Yeah, <laughs> so, so Lidos globally was much bigger though, yeah? Yes, so. the whole line of business was sold. It yeah. was about a 7.6 billion line of business yeah. that Lockheed sold to Lidos and with that money Lockheed Martin bought Sikorsky helicopters. Okay. Yeah. So – I think I'm, I think where I'm getting at here is how does a company of 30 people <laughs> buy a company of 800? Obviously, no, globally it was globally huge. Yeah, it was huge, yeah. yeah. And globally it was 50-50. Yeah, okay. So they were merging a 50-50 business, uh, which okay. proved some challenges for me because I was not merging. So all of the guidelines of the merger were you will put the roles out equally mm. between Lidos and Lockheed staff. Yeah. And, I'm, and I had a management team from my line of business that moved over to be my management team for the company. And they mm. were saying you have to open up the roles for the leaders of a thirty group of 30 in Melbourne. So some of that we had to work through. Again, yeah. you know, no reaction, just, yeah. okay, <laughs> let's just talk this through. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really make sense. The math doesn't work, right? Like <laughs> and, they were, and, you know, we worked through it. And <clears throat> so my leadership team moved across and ran the whole business. What was that like, that transformation, moving across to another business, new brand? Yeah, it was real. I mean, honestly, fantastic experience because Lidos and even now, look, defence companies aren't well known. Mm. Um, BAE are known now because of the ships. They're yep. building the ships. They have a big presence in South Australia. When I worked there, no one knew who BAE was. Mm. Um, Summit Boeing is known, of course, for the commercial aircraft. Yep. Lockheed Martin's probably known because it's the biggest. Yeah. But even Northrop Grumman, who's, you know, top five in the world, number one in space, a lot of um, the public don't know mm. these brands. So Lidos was not only not known uh, in the community, but it wasn't even known in defence mm. because it was a new player. So mm. we had a, a lot to do to um, get the brand known to our customer, uh, the model in new company. Uh, we had to entice people to stay, mm. you know, into this new company. Yeah, how, did, um, how, how did they feel about, yeah. I mean, moving what you mm. said and we all know is Lockheed's brand is really strong um, and the biggest to a company which, I mean, Lidos, who's Lidos? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, no disrespect, but no, I think you know, when, you, when you put it against Lockheed, it's, 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 it's in a different realm from a naming and branding Correct. point of view. And look, when you said no, no offence, this is the point, you've got to be realistic about mm. it. It's not just shirking and hiding from yeah. the fact that Lockheed is a very strong brand yeah. and Lidos wasn't at all. Yeah. You know, we had to understand our environment and then put our strategy around that. Mm. So we uh, really... Um, we really worked hard on what this new company would be. Mm. It is a new company. We can define everything. You know, we can – Lockheed is a legacy company, if you yeah. like. It's, you know, it's yeah, really yeah. embedded. So we had to find a narrative that attracted people. Now, some people never got over it, you mm. know, a small proportion. Yep. And nothing wrong with that. You know, they wanted to work at Lockheed or a brand and moved. But we held pretty good retention yeah, great. Um, with the new organisation and built a nice culture. Uh, actually, I just saw that Lidos uh, just was voted number one for the graduate program. There you go. Which is fantastic because we put a lot of effort into that mm. um, and the team have continued. So, uh, so, but, you know, we came off Lockheed Systems in one year. So we had to change because we were 800 on Lockheed and 30 that 30 didn't, weren't using the LIDOS system. So in the US it was a 50-50. Half the business was on LIDOS systems mm -hmm. and half were on Lockheed. So they had a very large portion of people that understood the LIDOS systems. But we changed in Australia every business system that we operated on in a year um, to a new system. And that was very hard. Mm. Um, so we did some great things, you know, established the business, did the transition uh, retain the people, won new contracts. Um, so I think we grew, I started with 800. When I left, there was about 1,200 people. That's amazing. Oh, I do want to sort of pick on the transition stuff. You, you like change I, I, we too, like, yes. We <laughs> like change, right? So, and, and I, I'm going to connect this with your LinkedIn profile, which actually says like you're an expert in in strategy, leadership and change management, right? So as a, as a role... Or as your role as a CEO, I mean, what what do you what do you look at when you when you're going and embarking on change? I mean, we as you know, we work a lot in that space and put and place a lot of importance on change yes. and the management of change. Yep. 
what is your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so Lidos was my first real leadership role in that significant change. When I finished there and went to Northrop, eyes wide open, we had to do the same thing. Not the same thing. We had to do fundamental transformation yep. of the business. And so I had a lot more confidence. Mm. Um, so number one, absolutely, is determining the strategy mm -hmm. and the vision. Mm -hmm. And we have a strategy on a page. Yep. Uh, we are extremely consistent. There's three key goals. Um, and we speak to those goals all the time. Um, and we, with every, so we've, this is my third year of the strategy for Northrop Grumman. And, you know, when we win a program, we announce it in relation to the strategy. Right. You know, when we... So you're providing context to what you're always, trying to do. When we put a new system in place, we relate it to the strategy. Great. And the strategy is, I love uh, the McKinsey's Three Horizons model. So mm -hmm. the, it's very basic, strategy on a page, three horizons. So it helps people understand the context of change. Yep. And I think it helps people understand that we can't do everything at once. Mm. That's why I really like the three horizons. And horizon one is our ruthless prioritisation. Mm. So it just, I think when people might have a different view as to how you've prioritised in that first horizon one, they can get some comfort that perhaps what they think is very important is in horizon two. Yeah. So I think that really matters. Yeah. So horizons, and then the third chart is your scorecard, which is your current year objectives. Mm -hmm. And we report those, we review them as a management team every month, and they are the Horizon One objectives. They have owners, they have time frame, and we publish them to our people every quarter to say how we're going. And at our town halls, we talk to that. Yep. So consistency, consistency, consistency. And communication. Yeah. 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 When you are, um, I think when you're embarking on this large scale transformation, um, what do you focus on as a leader? Like, so as, as in your role, yep. I mean, you as a leader cannot execute. Correct. Right. So I'm interested in your role within the transformation and, and your expectations of others within that, in, yeah. within that transformation. Yeah. And so, um, our structure is called the Australian Leadership Team. So there's nine of us on the top team, if you like. Yep. There's 65 in the senior leader team reporting mm. to that group. Mm -hmm. So my role has been, number one, to have harmony, cohesion and alignment in the top team. So it's my responsibility yeah. completely. Um, that top team is bought into the strategy, the three horizon and mm -hmm. the scorecard. Mm -hmm. um, the next step is to have the senior leaders buy into it. So the first year, the 10 people did the strategy, the three horizon and the scorecard yep. because we had to do it quickly. Yep. The next year, we prepared a draft and at our offsite with the 65 leaders, they had the opportunity to comment, you know, adjust, yep. share with us why we got that priority wrong and this one was more important. And we really took that information in and we adjusted the plan. So now in the second year, which was last year, the plan was prepared by 75 leaders, not mm. 10 leaders. Yep. Um, and so we also introduced last year two scorecards for the two lines of business. And so it's, it's kind of coming downwards. Yeah. Um, so that, that's so my you're building role. the maturity as building you... Building the maturity. Um, my role is also to, in the town halls with all staff is to remind them of that connectivity, remind them of the priorities and prove points of it's working. Mm. You know, I think people get tired if you, your promise is always, yeah. you know, down not, the road. Not realized, yeah. And so, you know, that's why it's so important when we win programs or we execute change systems, you know, we enhance the business, that we're celebrating it, talking about it and linking it back. So mm. that, that's, that's my role, to make sure that cohesive story narrative is very very clear i love it in in the defense industry culture is well actually let's just start here culture is an outcome right yes culture is a lag indicator um it's about what's happened or what's happening at the current state and we know that the defense industry is a high stakes industry there's a lot on the line pretty cutthroat 
what but but yet there are so many different types of cultures within so there's high performing there's growth and development like all these different yes. types of cultures what what is one that you subscribe to what is a culture that you're trying to build and how much emphasis do you place on it yeah um there's a couple of things i think there's the values that mm. underpin a culture Correct. so integrity we do what we and actually i love northrop grumman's we do what we promise yep what a great yep. value yeah we commit to shared success we do the right thing and we pioneer mm -hmm. which is the you know the the uh, innovation yep um, the values, so the culture's underpinned and this is, you know, what I would say I bring and and it's a small industry so you can't really get away mm. with being… Can't hide. Can't hide. <laughs> and so I would like to think my reputation is of I do what I say, you can trust me, there's integrity, um, partnership with my peers in industry. Yep. Um, and so… That underpinning value is very important to, the, to, to feed into the culture. Um, then the culture that we uh, see is, um, you know, there's something around defence that has a high level of regulation. Mm. And everything we do, you, we cannot be um, frivolous. Yeah. We can't take risks. You know, we've got standard specifications. We've got to mix. We've got cyber security. We've got security yep. uh, wrapped around our products and our solutions. It's audited, accredited. You know, there's a. It's so heavily regulated, which is why some small businesses just can't actually participate yep. because it just is so uh, high. So, it's a, so if you say, okay, we're highly regulated, then how do we get the agile in mm. that regulated mm. environment? Correct. And that's what we are. Um, I think that's what we're about. Is that we've got the background of the Northrop Grumman and the defence and the you know really. Um, uh, kind of long-standing, reliable with uh, a new team. So we're a new business. Mm. You know, we're like a, um, a stand-up with a, uh, a start-up with a, with a large program and a global powerhouse. But <clears throat> in the last three years, we've really reset the culture of the Australian business. Great. And that's attractive and exciting for a lot of people. Yeah. Has to be. I mean, with workforce shortages mm. in defence in industry, attraction and retention would be one of the yep. key things on your mind right now, wouldn't it? Definitely. Yep. And there's this theme, right? I, I've got this idea that if you if you're attracting people because you're able to pay, like you pay, and, and you attract them through paying more, I've kind of got this theory that it's it's a poor culture tax. <laughs> Right, because you have to attract someone with money as opposed to with the idea of being a employer of choice and someone who, or an organisation that actually is just doing amazing work and treats their people well and is flexible and all the yes. above that goes with yes. it, the employee employee value proposition. Yes, money is just one aspect of that. What are you and Northrop Grumman doing in regards to that? In regard, how do we attract some great minds, great people, great talent, and how do we keep them? Yeah. And we did one of the first things we kicked off, I kicked off when we did our strategy, uh, our first balanced scorecard objective under people was develop the employee value proposition. Yeah, this great. is your saying. Yeah, yeah. You know, so what can we offer, you yeah. know? And it is in, in the, in the really important work we do is an attraction for people, purpose. Yep. Um, we do have the flexibility. We do have uh, a, a tagline is more than a tagline at Northrop about defining your possible. Mm. So we really would like people – and in our newsletter every fortnight we have a story about a career movement yep. in Northrop. Yep. So we're, we're very much, uh, again, representing and then backing up with proof points that we allow people to move across the business and, yep. and are able to develop their career. Um, and, you know, the linkage to being part of the – incredible global company that makes the James Webb telescope, yeah. you know, the, the sixth generation aircraft is attractive as well. So yeah. we build that in and, you, and you, the salary has got to be around the mark, you know, yeah. you can't, oh, no doubt. Yeah, as yeah. you say, but to just, you know, push that ride out is not a long-term mm. viable arrangement. So that's our, that's our EVP. I, I, can we touch on the workforce shortages mm. within 
<coughs> within the defense industry. I mean, it, it, there's workforce shortages everywhere, right? Like, and and the the current state, there is this cash grab and whatever. And that's kind of eased a bit from what we <coughs> what we've seen and understand. But the the industry itself, so in, in Australia, I'm speaking specifically, serves one client. Yes. But yet we're stealing each other. We're stealing resources from from each other, and you yep. know it's a little bit inbred in some ways that you know people are going from yep. such and such and such and such. Because is there is there not a way in which we can solve this issue and, and go right? We're all serving the one client. We're all serving the one cause, which is building a sovereign Australia. Like surely there's a way in which we can manage resources that we get these outcomes and we move because yep. it's ten. You know, there's this ten year horizon that we need yes. to have everything by. Yep. With, with the lack of workforce, there's got to be a smarter way as an industry to, to come together. No, that's true. Um, I'll, I'll just comment though on the stealing between – No, I, uh, no, I, no, no, it's I, true I'm, and it's often comment. It's, it's something that I do, I do want to comment on. You know, most of us are project-based companies mm. and so projects uh, come to a close – yeah. And then they start and yeah. you might need different skills. Yeah. So there's downturn. And there's no doubt that you win a very exciting program and people will come from other defence companies and join you. You know, one of my competitors wins a very attractive one. Some of my people will leave and go and join. Yeah. So, so and that's happened since for my 30 plus years in the yeah. industry. So that will always happen. Um, and, you know, we have an understanding between the CEOs yeah. You know, a, around poaching. Yeah. Um, you know, you work with these guys a lot. So, again, it's a small community. So, we see that transition and it's, yes, it might be a little more or a little less at a time, but it's, I would call that normal. Yeah. But you're very right about, hang on a minute, but if you look at the demand signal, yeah. it is well beyond the current industry workforce so what are we going to do about attracting new skills into this industry Correct. and we see in South Australia particularly enormous amount of work going in from the federal government the state government the universities and industry on a workforce plan yep. for the shipbuilding the submarine mm -hmm. so that has not really ever happened before mm. uh, it's always been market driven yep. market forces and yep. it's been particular companies Setting up arrangements with universities, this has happened for many years, where you might have an arrangement with a university where you, you, know, you have internships and you might actually sponsor some special uh, degrees around defence engineering. Yep. So that's, but that's not at a magnitude scale, mm. that's at a kind of just yep. status quo. So, uh, so it is being done. Um, the fruits of that labour are yet to be seen because it's really early days. Yeah. Um, but we have to, as an industry, attract more people in. And this is why I will always say this this negative approach of um, – and it's not just media, but the commentary around failures in defence are not helpful. Mm. And a recognition that defence programs are often integrating technologies that haven't been developed yet. They're leading edge, yeah. complex, multi-year – you know, integration in the most high secure areas with, you know, highly regulated, it ain't easy. And mm. so, you know, yes, some are going to take longer and some are going to shift and move. So that reframing, you know, we all have an ob obligation, us and defence customer and government, to, to get a narrative out into the community where kids want to say, you know, oh, that's really exciting. Yeah. You know, that's next generation technology. I yeah. won't work on that anywhere else unless I'm in defence. I, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a massive advocate for that. But I, we, we do work in defence, right? And we um, have done work primarily with one of the people, the, the, industry, um, the companies that we've spoken about today. I won't say who. And we, we flew to the UK to do this piece of work. And I, can, I obviously cannot talk about it, but the, it, it's like James Bond meets Jason <laughs> Bourne. Meets, like it's just the, the technology yes. as me as is – outsider is so exciting yep. so exciting about some of the things that can be done and um from yeah i and i and i just think why why wouldn't you want to be i'm, I'm a bit of a tech geek so yeah, maybe that's yeah. why but i think it's, it is really exciting but what is interesting if you think about that and you put the the shoe on the other foot like i just said i can't talk about it i know 
So you, how do we talk? How about do you it? go to schools and yeah. educate and teach kids of some of? The, I think you can go. I mean, they'll, they'll be wowed with what you can talk about, I suppose. But yeah, it's it is just an interesting sort of. Um, there's a gap there. There is, yeah. And how to? And they're starting to talk more. I think for two purposes. One is for that mm. to have the attraction for talent coming in. The other is public advocacy of what we're doing. Yeah. So for the first time, I think it was a year ago now, I think the anniversary of a year that the head of ASIO tweeted was a couple of months ago. And, you know, he understood that he's got to start publicly talking about, you know, the, the height of the cyber impact, you know, mm-hmm. the, the what they're seeing, which they would never have done before. Yeah. So, and the purpose is to heighten public awareness but also, you know, to um, put it out there that there's these really, really difficult problems to solve mm. with really talented people yeah, come and do it in defence. And so, so we're seeing that. We're seeing a bit more public from the government engagement with the community around what's going on. Mm. Mm. While we're talking about the defence, with your deep understanding in the geopolitical landscape at the moment and your insights to future trends and... and what do you think the sector will look like in the next five to ten years? Well, uh, I mean, we can see this government initiated a independent review with a previous chief of defence force and a previous defence minister, mm-hmm. um, which they gave that um, review back. It was a very short review, about six months, and they put that to the government in March this year. And now the government has responded and said we will you know, absolutely take these recommendations and the Department of Defence is now working through how they're going to do it. Mm. And the strategic setting of that is that they believe that the strategic um, environment has come to a point where our adversaries have built up their capability so much that the 10-year that you spoke about is shrinking. Yeah, wow. And so they're talking about three phases and the first phase is kind of three to five years then five to seven, ten and Mm. ten plus. And so um, what we're seeing is a commitment to deter Mm -hmm. back to this, you know, what is the role of defence? Is it to kind of go and fight? Yeah. You know, it's actually the posture is that uh, that we wish to deter um, and prevent. Mm. And so to do that, you've got to have the capabilities to deter submarines, long-range strike and capabilities like that. That is an uplift. And so although in the first estimates, the forward estimates of the next four years, the budget is roughly the same, which had already increased. Uh, after that, the government is showing a, a high increase. So the industry responds to demand. Yeah. So the demand signal is very, very, very strong. And so therefore, the, the uh, question around where the industry will be, you'll have to, you'll have to think the industry will grow and be yeah. very strong. Yeah, I, I think what's scary for me back is that <laughs> the back to the talent, right? Yes. We don't have the workforce. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the scary thing. There's this threat on our doorstep, and we don't have the talent. Is it all right? Here's another. That's question. where you do. I mean, one of the areas that we also shouldn't overlook is the partnerships. Yeah. So you know, partnering with the United States. Yeah. You know, how much do we do? How much do they do? Mm. How much do we leverage off their capabilities? So. Um, we don't stand alone. No, it mm. just costs a lot more. Mm. <laughs> <It does. laughs> so while we're on this subject, what what keeps you up at night? Um, well, because I've learnt to kind of relax a little bit, yeah. I, I sleep very well. <laughs> um, look, I, I think I think in that dimension, you know, I do not want uh, there to be any engagement. So. You know, what keeps me up at night is is getting to a point where we do have a posture that deters. Mm. Um, do we have that posture at the moment? No. How that's lo- what the review said. Yeah. So I'm not, you know. No, no. But how long, how far away? Like what does a posture look like? Well, they're, they're now doing the defence posture strategy. Okay. So the, the kind of strategic setting is that we need to accelerate yeah. from our the government from Australia from our previous plan. So yeah. definition of what that is in the time and yeah. is not is not. Can you excuse yeah. the ignorance of this next question? I think about like you know, let's just use that ten year things. Like yeah. all right, the threats here in ten years, um, and the subs are going to take ten. The subs are going to take ten years, right? 
in my head I go, well, why wouldn't the threat just go, oh, we'll strike in eight or nine years? <laughs> like, <'cause if> we... <laughs> uh, because we have a Collin submarines. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, uh, and I think that's something that, that, you know, we are upgrading the current fleet. Yeah. We've had high availability of the current fleet. Yeah, yeah. And they are our deterrents for today. The, for the moment, yeah. And so the, the question is they have a life, we call it life of type. Yeah. So the, the end usefulness of the life of that platform. Mm. Um, and they have extended that, they are extending that life, but there's a point where, you know, well, obsolescence, you know, with anything that you have, you've yep. got to replace it. So the new submarines are for that replacement. So we aren't, we are not without. Yeah. However, to reinforce... Whilst we have the Collins, the agreement now is that the US will have Virginia class submarines out here from 2025. Okay. Um, and we will then be operating from 27. Okay. So there's that partnership again. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, using the 10 year number again, do you think if we went through a change management program and you know, you've said the industry is highly regulated, yeah, but somewhat probably too much. You know, pendulum goes one way, goes a bit too far from a regulation. There's yep. a way in which we can scale this back and get things done quicker. Yeah, do you think that's an opportunity? Yep, and and funnily enough, one of those key drivers of regulation is the restriction of the technology the U.S. government has on their knowledge, know-how technology, mm. and that's called the international trade regulations for US technology and that takes a long time. Mm. So, you know, again, what one would see if they're looking at the, our industry at the moment is Congress in the US are going through deliberations to reduce that timeline mm. and to make that more open and transparent. So, interestingly, this urgency has, well, it hasn't yet, but it is causing the US government to reflect on how they reduce their regulation for Australia to respond. Mm. So it is, you know, um, it is causing that effect. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I do want to touch on this because I do think it's uh, important for us to know. I think what, what with the threat imminent and it sounds like, you know, it's a pretty high level threat, right? I, we're not yeah, – here, here, maybe I'll put this in context – I was always told the old wars of, uh, you know, person to person is not going to happen anymore and it's just going to be all tech war and cybersecurity war and all this sort of stuff. But yet we're building things in case for the fact that of the actual, it seems to me like invasion, is that is that the threat? Is that what, what are we um, actually scared of? No, we're actually not so much scared of invasion. What we're scared of, it, well, not so, what, what the threat is, <laughs> what the threat is, is that the... There has been such an enhancement in um, our adversaries' capability that they could cut off sea lines for our trade. Okay. So it's it's really them affecting the, our livelihood and the way we live. Okay. It's not them landing a plane in um, Yellow Springs. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. So why in, invading, would so what, invading what, us? So the. The trade and affecting our livelihood, and, and again, ignorance in this question, why would they do that? Just because? Or because well, they want to hold us to ransom or like what's the, yes, what's yes, the motive? Yes, 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 power, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, you look at some of the, um, you know, look at what Russia's doing with Ukraine, you say, why would you do that? Yeah. Well, it's only to ex expand Russia's um, sovereign land. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and look at yeah, it logically to yeah. us. You think, what, why on earth have you just caused all those deaths, that yeah. disruption to two countries next to each other? When you already have the Europe. biggest land mass. Well, you know, why would you? <laughs> and this is the point around, you know, it would all be fine if everyone was reasonable and thought like us. Yeah. But they're not. So mm. that Russian example is a very predominant example of what could occur. So, so again, is there anything that the civilian and the public can do or should be aware of or is it just sort of sit and wait? Well, I, I think the, uh, the the government's role is to help the public understand what this is, you know, why we're spending a lot of money. You know, when I talk to my daughter who's 21 and uh, following her mother's footsteps, so probably a bit of a hippie, um, <laughs> you know, I, I talk to her and I say, what do your friends think about, you know, defence? Because 
you know, she certainly grew up with me and understands the dynamic of, you know, the necess- necessity of it. Yeah. If everyone was the same as us, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to have it in the most simplest terms. Um, and she said, look, I th- you know, what, what I see my friends, they're just thinking about why so much money, mm. you know. They can't, you know, I get it, but, but so much money and we've got climate change and we've got other things. Mm. As you said, you know, you, you think of all those submarines, 36 billion or whatever it is now. Mm. So I think there is a role certainly for the government to help the public understand why they have decided that that amount of money is the right amount of money mm. to support our allies, Japan, US, you know, yeah. your region and do what we're doing. Um, and NATO, you know, NATO commitments yeah. as well. But um, it's tricky. Mm. On family, you've brought up your daughter. Do you do you ever um, do you ever look at your career, as CEO, and and obviously the 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 clearance levels that you have, and uh, <laughs> you know you want to share information and 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 protect, but there's this like you've got to keep that level in line. How do you manage that? Oh, look, I think generally speaking, you know, I don't know that you need to understand the intricacies of, you know, when we talk about the build-up of capability that we're seeing, all right, so we may have seen what that is. Mm. Um, That doesn't really matter to the public, you know, the common person. So I think the messages can still be portrayed without, you know, needing to go into the detail. Mm. Do you – I mean, family plays an important part in our lives and I – no, it is a huge part of your value set as well. How have you managed your career and your family life over the yeah. over the years? And do you think you've got the formula right? Well, I I manage it like a project and priorities like my work really, mm. as in, um, you know, through the different stages of having children, and also with my husband, there's certain priorities. Mm that I protect and I trade off just as you do with business decisions, I guess. So, you know, I traded off playing squash when my kids were born. Mm. Squash just didn't fit and I Mm. love playing squash. Mm. I probably can't go back to it now because I'm a bit (laughs) old. But the – I loved it but you had to kind of pay it after work. Yeah. You can't, you know, at a time with another person. And when it got to trading off, you know, time at home, I had to let that go and I started running. Yeah. And running when I was away, you know, without time frame, you know, whenever I could. Yeah. So it's just a priority thing, yeah. I think. And and I see different people have different priorities. And I had a priority that I wanted to, which was very difficult in Adelaide. I did not want a nanny. Mm. I certainly wanted a cleaner, a cook and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to play with the kids. Yeah. When I got home, I wanted to have that time. And so, so I specifically... Went out and uh, in Adelaide there wasn't a service back in 20 years ago of, mm. a, uh, a, of cooking. Yeah. Like meals that you can get delivered yeah. now. There was, yeah. And so my girlfriend said, well, you live close to Flinders Uni. Why don't you put an ad out for a nutrition, someone studying nutrition? Oh, yeah. And I did and I had a young girl come Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, $20 an hour, $40. And she cooked for two nights, fresh food, and Wednesday two nights and we were done. And that, that meant I could come home. And I did come home and play with the kids and have dinner and do the bath and then hop back and work after that. And that suited my yeah. my boundary. And others are different. Others will, you know, everyone is very, very different in those priorities. But I, um, the advice I give is outsource. The things that aren't important to you, Yeah. outsource. Yeah. Give up your, your uh, you know, your nice dinners in the restaurant and... And pay for uh, people to do something for yeah. you that gives you more time. Yeah, <laughs> some might not have the cash on hand to be able to do that. I guess no, and it depends it, absolutely, and it depends on your own circumstances, and it depends on family support. You mm. know, we had my mum have a day with the kids, and my mother-in-law have a day with the kids. That was a routine for mm. probably five years. Yeah, um, which I thought was just wonderful and I hope I have a day with my grandkids mm. it was enough yeah. for them yeah um you know they were yeah. in the early 60s yeah uh, but that worked beautifully so you know that doesn't co- we did not pay our mothers to do that no. so that was free because yeah. you have 
Yeah, know? correct. So it's, it's you know, how do I work through this to get the, the best result, the best result for your family. With, with the resources that I have? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Now, I am conscious of your time. We, uh, we should look at rounding, rounding off now. Um, but I do want to ask a quick question about AI, which we could, oh, pro- right. which we could probably, we yep. could probably talk about for an hour or two. But I, yep. I'm a lover and obsessed with everything AI at the moment. I'm trialing out everything that comes our way, and I, um, but I think about AI in, in the defense and security space, and you know, cybersecurity and, and all of the above. And cybersecurity is generally. And, I, and I'm being very general, a lag industry as well. It is about, I mean, actually, no, that's wrong. They do have, they can build firewalls to stop people. But there's always someone or something that can be created that can penetrate the, the, the firewall. AI, which is 10,000 times smarter than us, has the ability to crack code quicker than any human could. Is that is is that a real fear for the, the defense world and just any corporate space that this AI has the potential to come in and navigate its way through undetected? Well, we use AI in, in many of our solutions. It's a bit like cyber. It runs. A, we don't sell cyber solutions. Our solutions are cyber proof yeah. and our solutions embed AI. Yeah. So certainly for defense, the aim is to have the human out of the loop as much as possible. Yeah. And the um, AI algorithms and learning coming in and giving information to the warfighter who can make yeah. decisions. Yeah. So it is an asset. Mm. Um, you know, AI as it develops, as you know, is a, is a kind of continual reinforcement of what what the machine is learning. Yeah, correct. Um, so it doesn't start with this intelligence. Mm. It's got to be programmed and then continually reinforced yeah, and so learned. Yeah, so some time to take. Ta- yes. yeah. yeah. So I, I, you know, I'm, I still have a view that AI is human controlled. I, I'm not yet of the view that we're in a space where the machine goes off and no. you know, will create. We're a while away. From we're that. a while away yeah. from that. Um, but someone with some time on their hands can. Yeah, and look, you know, we 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 know that the um, the uh, back to ASIO and, and places like that are hiring the most, you know cleverest people to to test their own mm. you know they break into themselves all the time just yeah. as just as businesses get yeah. a consultant company to go and test their yeah. resolve so you know i i just think it's another technology that that we adapt and we we focus on and we bring into our toolbox mm. i think it's very exciting it is very exciting and i think your your um right and probably above average to be adopting it um, as as much as you sounds like you are, <laughs> I think I'd encourage you. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely we're definitely welcoming of the opportunity yep. for it to s- streamline a lot of our processes. Absolutely, right? like it, it doesn't make sense to do it any other way. Right, final thoughts. If you were to give um, before we jump into uh, some quick fire questions, if you were to give advice to your younger self, um. Given, you know, looking back at your career, is there anything you would do differently? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of energy was spent in frustration for yeah. that calmness. Yeah. You know, I think I would say don't worry so much. Mm. You know, it'll work out. Um, you know, you'll get a job. Uh, don't worry about the bias, you know, mm. you'll get through it. So I think I'm a lot calmer. And so my advice would be probably don't worry so much. Yeah. 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 All right. Some quick fire questions to round off okay. the podcast. What are you reading right now? We're we're big readers here. Uh, <laughs> I am reading, and Brendan Nelson, who was that? I got to know Brendan when he was the director of the War Memorial. Oh yes. Um, I regard him very highly, and he has written a book of life and leadership. Okay, great. And I'm in the last chapter as we speak. Oh, so very he good. sent me a copy, and uh, and I love it. Yeah. Excellent. Of Life and Leadership. By Brendan Nelson. By Brendan Nelson. So if there was a self-development book, one that you've probably gifted more, like one that you actually really recommend, you go, this actually had an impact on my life, would there be one? Do you know what? I, I, I've not read a self-development book for a long time 
and I saw good to great on your. Yeah. I like that. I, I remember. I remember that. But I I get the self help from people's stories. Yeah. So the one I'd give at the moment is Wendy McCarthy's um, book that she wrote, which was called "Don't Be Too Polite Girls." Don't be too polite, girls. But Wendy McCarthy, who is um, um, ah yes. Has been around a long Looks like time. your jacket there. Does <laughs> too, Red. She's uh, you know phenomenal when you think of her and what she did around family planning and oh, yeah. you know changing the rules of men attending to women in birth and abortion and you know she's fundamentally changed the landscape mm. um, and just learning how she did that mm. in a time you know I'm talking about my life. She was 20 years before me. Yeah, with uh, uh, you know. Amazing impact. And so I just learn a lot from le- reading someone else's story. I probably do that more now yeah. than like Brendan's book, that Gail yeah, Kelly's 100%. book. No, I hear those. You. I'm a big autobiography. Love and Love yeah, them. absolutely. So what's one lesson that's taking you the longest to learn? I think it is that patience. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it is that patience. I'm still not there. Yeah. <laughs> Be patient. I suppose you'll get it. <laughs> Uh, if you could have coffee with one historical or current figure, who would it be? It has to be Brendan, uh, not Brendan Nelson. It has to be Nelson Mandela. Ah, yes. Again, I loved his book, Long Walk to Freedom. I just can't understand how he did it. No. And I had the absolute pleasure of a leadership course was in South Africa. We went to the island yeah. and we were allowed to go into his cell because normally as you go through, yeah. it's got a thing across it. Mm. And I stood in his cell and I just thought, how did you – so I would like to have a drink with him and just say, tell me. Yeah, it was a patient man. It's a patient man, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what is some of the best advice that you've ever received? Um, you're not always right. From Jim yeah, McDowell. From Jim McDowell. Yeah. I'm going fl- to I'm going to flick this uh, podcast to him. He'll love that his name has been <laughs> mentioned a few times. <laughs> What's one habit that holds you back the most? This is something I've been working on. Is and I'm I'm better now, but uh, when I do get very frustrated, I may swear, <laughs> and it's not the most uh, becoming or enduring or mm. helpful. Um, so I used to swear a lot. Yeah. Uh, now rarely, and it's probably better because it. Yeah, but it's never any good. People, your team doesn't want to hear. What if you're just swearing just because? Like it's just part of your language as opposed to swearing because you're angry or, well, I th- you know, I, I, no, no, that shit, no, let's not do that. Like yeah. as opposed to, well, that's no good, let's not do that. I think it depends on who is with you. Yeah. And if you understand that they're very comfortable because what I've realised is that other people don't you know, Some of my team don't swear mm. ever. So how does it sound... To them when yeah, – it's actually I, my husband who pointed it out when I was working from home and I was swearing. Yeah. And afterwards he said, Chris, how do you think they feel, you know, when you're you're the boss Yeah. And you're swearing? And, and I said, oh, yeah. yeah. He often does that. He yeah. says, ask me a question sometimes. My I husband. do that. I, I swear regularly. Well, it, uh, you know, I, and I, if you're I around often, people that swear. No, but I often think about it. And I'm do like, you? Oh, yeah. Oh. But then again, if we come back to what conforming and doing what's right and what's around, like it's kind of where I go, well, that's me. I, I grew up in the construction industry. I, it's, re- yeah. Yeah. Well, that was me. I was a Port Adelaide supporter. Yeah. So. But I'll tell <laughs> well, you've you got that your teeth, right? it's, really, <laughs> it's really interesting to think about how that's landing with people in the room. I agree. Yeah. I think about it all the time. Yeah. I'm like if And again if you're on a construction site it probably doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, but in the corporate world it, it's a different different thing. All right. Uh what's your biggest pet peeve? I can't I detest people talking about themselves. Oh really? You just spent an hour and a half Oh time. no. <laughs> oh, my god. <laughs> I mean pumping pumping yourself up. Yeah, no, true. You know. Starting off with I know this person and that person, mm. and, you know. Yeah. It just. Yeah. Oh, I'm a bit of a name dropper. Are you? Yeah. Because mm. oh, I, no, but do you know why? I know. <laughs> it might depend me, on. Don't give me that look. <laughs> I, it's more because I I love, I'm, I, I call myself a people collector, right? I love just collecting people and going, yeah, I know this person. I can introduce you or because I think that's the best well, that's way. that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. It's not because I'm like, I know, the, do you know who I am because I know these people? No, yeah, no, that's horrible. And I had it the other day with a, someone on a call telling me, you know, they knew the minister and they knew all these people. And I'm thinking. No. 
But I did. I name drop in our conversation out there when we were making coffee. Did you? Well, I said, oh, my next door neighbour. Yeah, but that was in context. Yeah, but still name dropping, isn't it? Context. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, very good. If you could pay someone to do your chores, well, you do. It's probably a bad question for you. If you could pay someone to do one of your chores, what would it be? Blow dry my hair. <laughs> Such a waste of time. <laughs> and I have to do it. <laughs> if I was absolutely gorgeous, I'd have a, a um, crew cut. Yeah. I'd have a do you reckon? I don't know. That. Do you reckon? <laughs> wouldn't have to bother. <laughs> I don't know how to be that comfortable. You come out of the shower, someone's standing there. With <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Otherwise, I would have done it. Yeah. What's one word that you absolutely hate? Um, I don't know that I do hate a word. Um, I tell you what I hate is at the football, everyone booing the player. Mm. I think it's disgraceful. Yeah. And they're doing it at the moment with Horn Francis. And they oh, did what, it with Adam Adelaide Woods. players? Or mm. Oh, no, they go no, to the any defense. ground and they, they boo him. They, if you watch the documentary about Adam Goods, it's just yeah. appalling. Horrible. Hate that. Mm. Mm. The, yeah. I, I find um, – I love football, right? but I'm a Geelong supporter. That's okay. Just <laughs> not Crows. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm definitely not Crows. <laughs> if there was – Oh, uh, we're playing this weekend, Geelong Port. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Look out. We should win here. Yeah, no, you, well, you guys are not Maybe. in the greatest form. Mm. Now, if I think that – I go – you know, when I talk about this question, one thing you absolutely hate, I hate football crowds – more than anything oh, else. Oh, do in you? Just because, generally? Well, because majority of people do not know the rules and they scream out stuff. And, I can, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that's clearly like what, <laughs> just because it, that player is on your team yes. doesn't make it okay. I yeah, can anyway, see that. I, get, I can see that frustration. I get, very, I get very annoyed. Anyway, I'm using logic in this. Yeah, There's a lot of emotion in a crowd and it frustrates me. Okay, what's one thing that you would do if you became invisible? I don't know. I, <laughs> it's a bit of a creepy question. It is. And the only <laughs> thing I could think of which is I used to like to go to the huddle at footy again. Yeah. I used to go to the huddle at Alberton. Wouldn't you just rather be present at the huddle as opposed to invisible? Well, no. Well, I'm not allowed to be there. Yeah, I know. So I'd like to sneak out <laughs> at quarter time on Cadinia Park and listen to what Ken <laughs> says to the boys and then go across and listen to. Yeah. I yeah. can't really think of anything else that I'm, you know. No, it's fine. It's yeah. uh, that's good. What's your most useless useless talent? <laughs> Something like the games that I'm good at. I play doubly with my father, backgammon. Oh yeah, I'm very good. Yeah, I only play with my father. <laughs> it's useless, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, it, I well, think. it creates some joy. Yes. In, so it's He's not, 93 and he not still a, beats me. Yeah. But I beat him too. Very competitive. Yeah. I, don't, I don't let down. I, mean. I love it. And uh, we ca- we got to end the, the podcast with a joke. Have you got a shit joke? Oh, I'm not very good at this. The, the only <laughs> – I just remember my kids having a joke. They used to say, why does the computer cross the road? Why? Because it thought it was a chicken. <laughs> and that was their joke. <laughs> I like that. It's very nice. I used to say pewter because I was yeah. so young. Yeah, very nice. That computer's got some AI written yeah, into there it. You go. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you uh, very much for your time today, Christine. It was it was lovely chatting to you. It was an amazing story and kudos on your career. It is a phenomenal career. Thank you for sharing your insights to the defence industry. It, it, it is one that is super, super important to the obviously longevity and uh, everything else of Australia. Um, and thank you for all the work that you and the team and, and the industry are doing in that in that sector and in, in making us safe. Um, if people were to get in contact with you, I think I know that you do a lot of keynotes as well. So if they wanted to be in touch with you and connect with you, how could they do that? LinkedIn. LinkedIn? Best way. Best way? Yeah. Yep. Excellent. So Christine Zeitz on LinkedIn. Yep. Uh Beautiful. I think that's it from us. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thanks. We'll uh, we'll catch us all soon. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the podcast all. You can check out the show notes if there was anything of interest to you and find out more about us at synergyiq.com.au. I am going to ask though, if you did like the podcast, it would absolutely mean the world to me if you could subscribe, rate and review. And if you didn't like it, that's all right too. There's no need to do anything. Take care, guys. All the best.